MDS Creativers in conjunction with Seleucia University presents Conversations on the Law. Greetings. Welcome back, my dear friends. It's a privilege to meet, especially nowadays. You cannot take these meetings for granted. We need to take time every time to thank the Lord whenever we come together. Let us start with a word of prayer. Kind and gracious Father in the heavens above, thank you, dear Lord, for the privilege of coming to study on the law of business, study on employment law. And dear Father, we know that you and I are co-laborers. You and the viewers and listeners are co-laborers. And dear Lord, help us to appreciate the law on earth and the laws in heaven. This has been our prayer of faith. In Jesus' name, amen. As promised, we're looking at uh, employment law. And uh, I want us to look at the Labor Act. It has since been revised. I think it should be the Labor Act of 2019, um, but looks materially the same as uh, the version from 2006. I'm here to figure out where the differences are. I've not given myself much time to figure those differences, but I haven't seen much. Now, when you go into the Labor Act, the, in our last uh, discourse, we looked at that the government can regulate for the sake of good governance and uh, good governance in terms of uh, the International Bureau of Education, the UNESCO um, uh, quotation I gave. It has to look at issues of accountability, uh, participation, and so on and so on. Now, when you look at the purpose of the Act, particularly in close, um, I mean, in section number 2A and subsection 1, this is what the Labor Act provides for. The purpose of this Act is to advance social justice and democracy in the workplace. So when you talk about social justice, we're look, simply looking at fairness, that we our operations are done in a fair manner in the workplace. And uh, secondly, there is democracy. Democracy has to do with the participation of all the parties so that everyone can come in and it's a basically um, a majority-inclined kind of operation. It should not be a dictatorial kind of an operation. So when you look at um, paragraph A, this is what it then goes on to say on the purpose of the act. Giving effect to the fundamental rights of employees provided under part two. So we want to look at these fundamental rights and uh, for today, we're going to zero in on discrimination as far as recruitment especially is concerned. And paragraph E provides as follows. For the promotion of the participation of employees in decisions affecting their interests in the workplace. So this now has to do with participation. It must be a participatory enterprise. It should not be, um, it's my way or the highway kind of an approach. So as we look at how the Labor Act now comes to regulate, it regulates basically the employment contract. And so should you have other instruments that may come in and have something to say, the Labor Act has a supremacy clause, and you will find this in, sub -paragraph, in paragraph number three, uh, it says, this act shall prevail over any other enactment inconsistent with it. This is on employment issues. So this is the primary instrument as far as employment is concerned. So as we look at it, we're not looking at um, the employment law in detail, but the principles that would affect the operations of business particularly. So as we look at it, we're going to be looking particularly at uh, section number five, uh, that is under part two of this uh, instrument. But before we go on, it is prudent that we look at some definition of terms. There are things that we think we know and we know we know, but like Augustine, when we are asked to define them, we might not really know how to define them. Now, the Labor Act goes on to define what an employee is. So having said that background, what is an employee? It says an employee means any person. So when, the moment we say any person, let's go back to our part one, uh, a person can be natural, or juristic or legal, juristic or legal. So a natural person, it's you and I. A juristic person or a legal person is an artificial person who is registered in terms of the Companies Act. That is an artificial person. You could have um, other artificial persons who may be registered in terms of other instruments of the court. I mean, I mean, I mean of um, parliament. So when you look at this person, this person must perform work or services for another person. 
Now, you'll notice that the first part, we're talking about a natural person, that is the employee. And the employee performs work on behalf of a natural person or a juristic person. So when you look at, um, you could have a scenario whereby you are employed to work for someone as a maid. You, you, you are an employee. You're working for someone as a gardener. You are an employee, but you are working in a residential space. And um, I am an employee of Solus University. Solus University is, an, is a corporated um, institution in terms of the charter. So it is an artificial person. So as I work for Solus University, I am a natural person, but Solus University is a juristic person. So this is the kind of relationship that comes in. But uh, that besides, I haven't looked at that. It goes on to say, this person must work for a remuneration or reward. There must be a payment that is going to be made. In our next session, we want to look at uh, issues of remuneration and contracts. And uh, besides the reward, it must be on such terms and conditions as agreed upon by the parties. So when you look at uh, the issue of the terms and conditions as agreed upon, this already points us to that there must be consensus ad idem. There must be an agreement. There must be, in modern parlance, a contract. So this contract that we're going to look at, we want to then study it, particularly in uh, section number 12 of the Labor Act. So just to recap, this is an employee, whether natural, uh, of, of course, this is an employee who is natural who is employed by a natural or a juristic person in return for remuneration or a reward as agreed by the parties. So these two parties must come to a consensus on what shall be done and what shall be paid in return for the job. And at A, listen to what um, uh, A then provides. It says, in circumstances where, even if, this is a condition, even if the person performing the work or services supplies his own tools. Now, the, the, the common law position had been the employer is the one who supply tools. So if you supply your own tools, you're not an employee. So the, the codification now makes this clear and says, now, even if you supply your own tools, you're still an employee. Secondly, even if you work under flexible conditions of service, especially in these COVID days. Um, what we have seen during the COVID days is people didn't have to report for work. The typical work arrangement is by 8 o'clock, be at work, by 4.30, you knock off. But people didn't have to come to work. They had to do work from wherever they could, anytime they could, as long as the work was done. That did not convert those people into um, service providers or into contractors, as it were. They still remained employees in spite of the flexible conditions. They do not have to report at a particular time, take a break at a particular time. They remained employees. This, this, this particular provision uh, becomes even clearer as we read it now. Prior to COVID, it, it would have been very difficult to understand this section in our definition of an employee. So this is what an employee is. Number one, even if you're bringing in your own tools, you could have a scenario where you are um, going into the, the modern types of work, money trading. So you, you can become an employee. But as a money trader, they will tell you, you must bring your own computer. So let's not always imagine not, uh, tools in the context of um, hoes, picks, and shovels. So when you bring in your own laptop, you're working from your space in your house, and you're a money trader. I, I, I mean the Bitcoin guys who are always on Facebook. Hi, I'm so and so, and I live in Jobek. And th those kinds of people, they, they are really a pain for you if you're on Facebook. So those guys are employees. Even though they do not report for work every day, they are employees. And um, here's the other thing. There is a, a juxtaposition of what an employee is and what uh, an employer is. This is where the employer begins to be defined. An employer, it says, the hire provides the substantial investment. So it has to do with uh, how much one contributes. So when you contribute substantially into the enterprise, into its operations, and you are covering its, um, its uh, financial expenditure, you are an employer comparatively, you're being compared to the other person. So that's what makes you an employer. And secondly, you do not only provide the substantial investment, you also assume the substantial risk of the undertaking. So what is the substantial risk here? This is the liability. In the event that things go wrong, who shall be sued? So if you are the one who's going to cover the risk, should we have uh, a loss being incurred? You are the one who has taken out the loans, 
So you're the one who's going to foot the bill. So the one who assumes that risk becomes the employer. So even if we were to go into a work setup, the two of us, I'm the one who got the job, and um, I've said, my friend, I need someone who's going to do this kind of thing. And uh, ha having gotten the, the, the job tender, we call it tenderizing, right? You, you, you've gotten the tender. The people you bring on board, you are the one who invests. You are the one who takes the risk. If things go wrong, the one who has uh, given you the tender is going to sue you. They will not sue your friends. So you are the employer, the one who's going to be sued. And uh, of course, B, uh, still on the definition of an employer. It says, in any other circumstances, that more closely resemble the relationship between an employee and employer than that between an independent contractor and hirer of services. So anything that does not qualify for an independent contractor will automatically become an employee-employer relations. So an independent contractor, you remember when we did um, the relations between uh, uh, entities in, in a business setup. We said you, you could have um, a company which is procuring services from another company. So the other company that supplies these services is a contractor, an independent contractor. This is not a relationship that is regulated by the employment law or that is regulated by the Labor Relations Act. That kind of a relationship will be regulated by the Companies Act because they are negotiating at par. So we are not looking at participation. We're, looking, we're not looking at advancing social justice. The, 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 the ground is level in this case. Freedom of contract would really make sense. But where you have an employee and an, and an employer, then this is where the distinction begins to arise. So now let's quickly go over to what an employer is. The act goes on to say it means any person whatsoever who employs or provides work for another person. So this is now clear. Having understood what an employee is, it only follows that whoever goes into that kind of an arrangement for another becomes the employer. And this person must also provide work. So whoever gives you the duties, whoever gives you the contract is your employer. The one who tells you what you're going to do is your employer. So it's the span of control. So if someone has control over what you do, that is your employer. The one who tells you, Tomorrow, we're doing this. Next month, we're doing this. In three months, I need this. By year end, we should do this. The one who sets the targets is the employer. And um, goes, goes, goes on to say, <laughs> this is the interesting part, remunerates whoever pays you. So the person must uh, um, give you work. They must pay you. So number one, besides investing and the undertaking element, the person must give you work. This is the third condition. And fourth condition, they must remunerate you. Or expressly, so expressly written, or tacitly implied, undertakes to remunerate you. So there's a part where this person now um, makes a commitment. So when you expressly undertake, this is where you make a promise. This is where you issue it in writing. Tacitly, it is implied that you're going to pay this person. So there are these other Examples, people who can also pass as employers, even though they may not be your ordinary employers. Number one, we have a manager, the manager. So who is the manager? The manager is the one who does work on behalf of the establishment. So your CEO, your managing director, your, in my context, the vice chancellor would be my employer. Even though he's also an employee of the university, but when we operate, he is my employer. And you could also have an agent. Who is an agent? An agent is an authorized person, one who is authorized to transact on behalf of a principal. So if they can prove that they have been so authorized, they become an agent. And if they cannot prove that they have been authorized but conduct themselves in a manner that is consistent with their being authorized, even though they're going to overstep their boundaries, this is now what we would refer to as ostensible authority. We'll look at this in the next session, ostensible authority. And then you could also have a representative of such person, whoever can come through as a representative would also uh, become an employer if they are in charge or control of the work upon which such other person is employed. That becomes your employer. Then the other employer will be your judicial manager. 
So you talk, talk about your rescue operations for legal um, persons. Uh, when companies are becoming insolvent, they go under judicial management. So whoever becomes the judicial manager who has been appointed by the court becomes, assumes the role of the employer in essence. So this is a, a replacement. The typical employer steps down and the judicial employer becomes the employer. And uh, should you have a scenario where you need now to liquidate um, the operations, the liquidator becomes the employer or, or, or the trustee in this case. And this is now in terms of the Insolvency Act. So the liquidator, remember when we looked at um, accounting principles, we said um, when you look at assets, assets are fixed and assets are liquid. So when you procure um, an asset, a fixed asset, you are capitalizing. When you convert a liquid asset into cash, you are liquidating. So you're going to find a situation where you have uh, creditors, you are owing people. When you owe people, what then happens is you convert your physical assets into liquid assets so that you can service your debts. So the person who comes in to wind up operations, that is the liquidator. So for us to understand this from a business perspective, not, le not necessarily a legal one, from a business perspective, what it simply means, this is the person who is charged with um, converting the physical assets of an entity into liquid assets so that they can service the creditors. That becomes the employer at that point. And besides the liquidator, you could also have uh, a, a situation whereby one is the executor. So what is an executor and an executrix? Um, the, the executor is the one who is appointed in terms of a will. So someone who administers the estate of another. So when you've been appointed in terms of a will and you're administering the estate of the deceased, at that point you become the employer because you have over... I mean, you have taken over the, the operations of, uh, of, of the estate. So you become uh, the executor in terms of uh, the, 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 the high court uh, decision. So you don't just say, I've, I've become the executor. You, you don't confer that status upon yourself. You don't confer the status of uh, a liquidator or judicial manager upon yourself. And then the other one uh, would be where you are a curator for someone who is... Um, uh, mentally, uh, a, a, a mental health care user. So when you're a curator and um, you, you basically take over the operations. Now, what I promised last time, having done this background, is that we want to look at recruitment. We said, as far as employment law, we want to look at how there is regulation around recruitment. So that as we go into the workspace, either for attachment or some of us already running companies, as you are recruiting, and uh, some of us are completing our studies, you're going to be seeking to be recruited. So what are the provisions? What does the government have to say in, in, as far as advancing social justice in particular? What does it have to say? And this is where now we move over to section number five. And section number five provides for the protection of employees against discrimination. I'll, I'll, I'll um, um, encourage you to find um, Dr. Myaradze Kwesai's book on employment law. It's going to turn out very helpful. I found it very helpful. It's, the, um, it's a copy that I have lying around somewhere here. Uh, I wish I could have shown it to you, but maybe I'll, I'll, I'll show it to you some other time. But uh, maybe let me just uh, put the title down here. This is the title down here so that you can um, go and um, grab a copy, especially if you're interested much in the HR side of uh, the business law. Now, on discrimination, this is what I'm going to stress. Now, it's as if the, the Labor Act is written in reverse. Discrimination seems to be uh, identified at uh, Section 5, Subsection 6. You'd have expected Subsection 6 to be the one on Subsection 1. If I were to write the Labor Act, I would have put Subsection 6 in Subsection 1 because it, it, it tends to set the scope of what discrimination is. Why do I say so? It says, for the purposes of this section, a person shall be deemed to have discriminated if his act or omission causes or is likely to cause persons of a particular race, tribe, place of origin, political opinion, color, creed, or gender to be treated A, less favorably, or B, more favorably than 
persons of another race, tribe, place of origin, political opinion, color, creed, or gender, unless it is shown that such act or omission was not attributable, attributable wholly or mainly to the race, tribe, place of origin, political opinion, color, creed, or gender of the persons concerned. Now, this is where you shall be deemed to have discriminated. And this purpose already makes something very clear from the get-go. So you can discriminate positively by act. You can discriminate by omission. So you can do something that is discriminatory. Or you can abstain from doing something that results in discrimination. So when you go into recruitment, later on you're going to realize where these pockets would, uh, would be, where discrimination would be etched, where we can find it. And the issue that we, we are to find is that discrimination, where it is positive, it would be a result of an act. Where it is also probable, it, it does not, we would not have to wait for it to play out, to say, now this is discrimination, now we can act on it. Where it is likely, likely to cause, so, 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 so you, you're going to find that the bar that has to be proven is quite low. You can wait for the discrimination to happen and then you can raise it where you have observed it, where you have suffered it. But where you can foresee it coming up, at that very point, you can now take it on and say this is discrimination. And it, it violates the purpose of the entire instrument, the entire act. What is the purpose to advance social justice in the workplace? So what will this discrimination do? This discrimination, number one, it's, it's very interesting will result in less favorable conditions for another person. So this is already comparative. When you say less favorable, that means you need to give a juxtaposition to say this one is here, A is here, B is here, therefore that is discrimination. But you can also prove the inverse. The inverse is more favorable conditions. You can say B is here, A is here, therefore that is discrimination. So it, it does not necessarily mean you, you, you can only, you, you, you need only um, be uh, the disadvantaged one. You can prove that others have been advantaged. That is still discrimination. Or you can prove that you have been disadvantaged. That is discrimination. So proving either of the two amounts to the, 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 the elements of, uh, of the claim. So when, when you prove discrimination, you can also prove um, one exclusively. So in, in, in a setup, I, I cannot come up with a, an immediate example. In, in a setup where there's a job advert that simply says black people only should apply. So all you have to prove is that you have not been invited to apply. So, so it is already less favorable. There are, no, there are no white people that are on the list. That is discrimination on grounds of race. So there, there, are, there, there, there are no uh, ZANU-PF supporters. That is discrimination on grounds of political opinion. So all you have to prove is that you are not within the circle. So you are proving the less favorable conditions. But you could prove a scenario whereby you are part of the circle, but the treatment is different. You have others getting more than what you are receiving. This is the juxtaposition. So as, as you go through this, you're going to notice that all these um, elements that are listed, you could have race, tribe, place of origin, political opinion, color, creed, gender, and on and on. Um, you know, in uh, African countries, you know, there the, is the issue of um, tribalism. And um, even when you get within the issue of tribalism, there is the place of origin. You know, it, it, it gets quite complicated for us. You know, most people will not understand this. But you could have um, a, a scenario whereby... Um, you go to the, to the Mashonal inside, you, you, you have the Karangas, you have the Ndaus, you have the, you, you, you have the Manikas, you know, all, all, all those kind of uh, other dialects that you can have. Now, to, to, to someone who is a Ndebele speaker, all of them are just Shona. You just say, what's the issue? You, you all speak the same language, but there is a dialect difference in the... So, so you're going to find that people are now being considered based on placement. So when you come to the Matebelelen side, you're going to find that within that whole pocket, you're going to have different tribes in there. 
you have the Ndebeles, you have the Kalangas, you have the Nambias, you have the Kosas, you have the Shanganis, you know, all, 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 all these other tribes are right in there. So if you look at these, uh, maybe even at the vendors and Bay Bridge, at the Tongas and uh, around Binga area all the way to Karipa, th those, those are other dialects that are within the, the Matebeleland side. And when you go into those areas, then you find that you, you're going to be dealing with people according to where they come from. Uh, these ones are coming from Gai, these are from uh, Lupane, these are from Loa Kuelo, like myself, these are from Cholocho, these are from Plum Tree, Vic Falls side. So, so, so it's about where you come from. So the, 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 the labor environment should not be punctuated by such practices. Those are not an advancement of social justice. They actually take social justice back. So the labor environment must look at uh, performance. It must look at your ability to deliver. It should not be about the language you speak. Uh, maybe thanks to colonialism, the language, uh, the lingua franca is English. So if you can converse in the language of choice, you're good to go. Of course, the constitution will then provide that 18 other languages, including um, Braille, they're languages that are recognized. So, so if it is not really mandatory, uh, the nature of your job for you to be even conversing in, in, in English, you, you, you may even have a chance. Just, just imagine, you're, you're being employed as someone to, to load uh, bricks onto your truck. Does the language you speak matter? Does um, your place of origin matter? It, it might not. So these are some of the things that the Labor Act now sees to, to, to bring about that parity. And uh, as we take off on the list that has been given there, you'll notice that age is not mentioned. But when you go into other jurisdictions, you'll find that age is an issue. You cannot discriminate on grounds of age. The Labor Act doesn't mention this. And secondly, the other item that is not mentioned here is sexual orientation. Of course, um, um, your liberal thought, school of thought, says gender is, is not biological. Gender has to do with how society perceives or, or defines who you are. So some have sought to argue that sexual orientation will go into gender, but I think that is stretching it far too thin. Uh, gender is clear. It's just um, less um, demeaning and graphic as in sex. So gender has to deal with how um, the social scripts, let me put it that way. The social scripts are the type of uh, intonations that women exist to bear children and contribute to the population of the state. The, 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 the state. So that becomes a, a, a gender discrimination kind of uh, issue, although it hinges on one's biological um, makeup. So that is gender. And age is not there. But of course, these are items that can always be, be argued. And then um, you also want to take note now. Let's go to recruitment. And this is now in uh, subsection number one. We're still in section five and subsection number one. It goes on to enumerate the same things that we covered. No employer shall discriminate against an employee, any employee or prospective employee on grounds of race, tribe, place of origin, political opinion, color, creed, gender, pregnancy, HIV status, or subject to the Disabled Persons Act. That is chapter 17. So any disability referred to in the definition of disabled persons in that act or in relation to it goes on to list. Now, what I want us to even, um, let's just pause here. Take note that as we're looking at, um, uh, what, what, what was it? Uh, number six, uh, yes, yes, yes. As we're looking at number six, number six seems to be looking at a, a, a relationship that has already taken off, that is already in place, we're in full swing. But um, number one, subsection one, this is what I like about it. It now defines to say this discrimination can happen in the workplace or can also happen at the point of inception. So we're talking about employees of an enterprise or the prospective employees. So when one is a prospective employee, the relationship has not yet started, but the, the, the court already begins to, I mean, the, the, the law already begins to, um, guide the process. So in, in this case, we have already looked at race, we have looked at tribe, 
uh, place of origin, we've looked at that. Political opinion, this one is an interesting one. So where it is not um, a political party that has made, um, what you call it, uh, an advert, the rest of us should not find ourselves um, disadvantaged on grounds of our political opinions. Whichever political party you, you choose to support, that is your, your right. No, no one should uh, bother you to say, why do you support this one and not that one? Because you're not with me, uh, as far as the political parties are concerned, I'll not employ you. So these are some of the things that uh, one has to look at. So when you look at that, uh, the other thing that you're looking at is creed. So creed, this is um, your religious uh, leaning. So when you look at the religious leaning, um, I, I do not know why the Labour Act chose to, to do, um, to, to use this, uh, this old type of English. I used to have a hard time figuring out where is the religious uh, um, opinion there, and it's covered under creed, that is uh, the old English for creed. And then we looked at gender. The other one is pregnancy. You cannot discriminate against someone on grounds of pregnancy. Where would this arise? This would arise in uh, the workplace, whereby you are um, coming into the workspace and uh, the employer notices that you're already heavy. And uh, because of that, you're not employed. That would be discriminatory. You should not be denied an opportunity to be employed because you are pregnant. And um, if you look at, uh, is it section um, 18? I'm, I'm not sure, I'll have to check. Section 18 of the Labor Act, I think that's the one that provides for, for maternity leaves. Uh, that section says um, a, a lady who becomes pregnant within the first uh, 12 months of employment is going to take unpaid uh, maternity leave. But if you read this against uh, the constitutional provisions, uh, I'm not sure that it's 60, section 65, I think, every, every lady is entitled to, to paid maternity leave. So th there is a need now for, for, for the courts to, to synchronize the Labor Act with the Constitutional Court. I do not know why this remains un, unresolved. Now, it's not clear anymore what would happen in a scenario whereby an employee becomes pregnant or is already employed at the point of being pregnant, and um, they now have to take their maternity leave within the first year. For business purposes, it does make sense because paid maternity leave would be about 98 days out of work, so the employer may not have budgeted for that within that financial year. But uh, budget or not, or, or no budget, this is the law. Every woman is entitled to paid maternity leave. So um, to deny them that first maternity leave will translate to a violation of their constitutional right. But anyway, these are issues that you're going to discuss in greater detail when you do your HR and uh, your employment law or your personal law. That's where you're going to look at these. But now let's look at the pockets where discrimination may arise. Uh, at A, this is paragraph A, the advertisement. Now this one has been singled out. When you do your HR, you're going to realize that recruitment is a process. You're going to have the advert being sent out. That is part of the recruitment exercise. But uh, it has been singled out as the first part. So when you then send out an advert, you cannot send out an advert that says, I'm going to um, employ people who are HIV negative only. You, you cannot make that a condition in your advert. And uh, should you do so, you cannot even uh, test people compulsorily, even though some companies, they still do test you. They'll, they'll send you for a checkup and do your, 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 what do you call that? Your blood count. Yes, yes, your blood count. When they do the, the, the blood count uh, tests, they can figure out that your CT4 is a bit low, then you may be compromised. And they, they, they may not take you after that. So these are some of the um, tests that they can do to go around it. And, uh, but it can, if it can be established that you have been um, uh, left out on grounds of uh, your medical condition, that is discrimination. That is discrimination. And then B, this is paragraph B, the recruitment, right? So the recruitment for employment. Now, this is interesting. So I've already said the advert is already part of the recruitment. Why do I say so? When you go into human resources, the first thing you're going to do is the HR planning. The HR planning is the one that is covered at C, the creation of a post. 
So you first of all have to create a post within your organization. Plot it on the organogram and have a job description that attaches to the post and thirdly have a job evaluation instrument that you're going to do, your assessment instrument, your instrument you're going to use. When you are done with this, you now have the job, you have the person profile. Who is the kind of a person that we need? These are the expertise that we are looking at. This is the experience that we're looking at from this person. Now that you have all this in place, the next part is that you now draft and publish an advert, whether on your website or you're doing it through the traditional press. So when you have sent out your advert, what is an advert in this case? Go back into your contract law. Your advert becomes your invitation to treat. You simply say, I, I have a job that needs to be done. I have work to be done. If it is an interest to you, tender your application. So it's an invitation to treat. At that point, when you, this person now brings in their application, you go on to shortlisting. So this is the paper review. So when you're shortlisting the candidates, you, you, you need to then check, do they meet the profile that you have set? You're still in the recruitment purpose. I mean, uh, recruitment um, um, process. And um, after you have uh, done the shortlisting, you then invite the person for an oral interview so they can make representations depending on what you'd have asked them to, 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 to place in their adverts. So depending on the level of, or, of entry, the job that you're applying for. For some jobs, you, you just put in your resume and they ask you to put in your vision for, for the enterprise or the undertaking you are joining. So when you go into the oral interview, you're simply motivating your vision. It's not um, your, your typical, so tell us uh, who are you and, you know, it's not that kind of an interview. The, the, the further higher you go, that information is already there in your resume, it's there in your CV. They've looked at that, they've vetted you. So by the time you go for the oral interview, they now want to find out whether you're a strategic fit into the entity, whether you can deliver on the expectations. When you have done the oral interview, the next thing that now follows is the job offer. This is where now they say, Mr. MK, we're going to be we're offering you and this job, this is the job you're going to take. This is the remuneration salary aspect that you're going to take. This is the scope of your operation. This is what you're going to do. These are the benefits you're going to have. Uh, that is the job offer. And before you resume work, you then undergo an orientation exercise. After the orientation, now you are at work. You may be given um, um, a period to prove yourself, uh, after which you can then be confirmed. But uh, that, uh, that, that is neither here nor there. When you are now on the job, you are now employed. The recruitment is done. It's done. After orientation, you're good to go. So when you look at this, the, the, the act then says you cannot discriminate any way within that recruitment process. Even though they've put it as just one word, the business person you are must know that recruitment can then uh, be found at advert point, it can be found a short listing, it can be found in oral interviews, it can be found in job offers. And you could also have um, discrimination in orientation. Now let's uh, quickly move on. I've already looked at um, a paragraph C briefly. Uh, on the, you, you, you'll notice that uh, this is the process that is being um, administered by the employer, what we have covered there, or that is being administered by the employer. And then let's look at uh, paragraph C. Paragraph C is more structural. You see, you can have discrimination within the structure. And where does this discrimination arise? At the creation of posts. When you are creating a post, this is HR planning now. You could have uh, discrimination there where you're already creating posts with uh, a particular um, biological uh, gender in mind. You're creating a post with uh, a particular race in mind, a particular tribe in mind. Um, you, you know, you could have, um, let, let, let me put it this way. It's always easy to, to visualize uh, discrimination where the high po higher posts are reserved for a particular tribe. But you could have a recruitment uh, bias where the lower posts are reserved for a particular tribe. Uh, I, I, I getting where it becomes less favorable. So someone can prove that in the entire entity, in the entire organization, people of this particular tribe are, 
are, are supposed to be relegated to become security guards. They're supposed to become gardeners. Those of that particular tribe will not become this particular job. Uh, they, they will not go into this particular job. Now, let's look at gender. I, I don't want to use, um, uh, mention any tribes for, for correctness, just in case I hurt someone. But you could have even, even in the work environment where we have um, told ourselves that the receptionist always has to be a lady. Uh, the secretary always has to be a lady. It's as if we have preserved those jobs for ladies. Who said a, a man cannot be a, a secretary? A man cannot be uh, the receptionist? So you have some organizations that you'll get to and find that, yes, they, 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 they have that gender equity. But these are some stereotypical kind of uh, social scripts in the, in the workspace that tend to define some of these characterizations in the job creation. Job creation. The other thing uh, that we're looking at is classification. What is classification? This is job evaluation now, where you're grading jobs. To say this job is going to be on grade one, grade two, grade three, if you're using the partisan scale, and go all the way down to grade, some go up to grade seven, some to, grow, to grade 11. So when, when you are classifying those jobs, you, you want to look at the, the decision-making scope and not necessarily the people. It is not the, the incumbent that you're looking at. You're looking at what ought to be done. And the other thing that you're going to look at is or abolition of jobs or pause. This is now redundancy. So when in the organizational structures, we have said uh, the HR planning is where you're setting up the organization. And then secondly, you're looking at what this job entails. That is the job evaluation. And then when you are right-sizing, you are rendering some jobs redundant because maybe of um, they've become obsolete because of, um, let me look at uh, industrialization, technological use um, in the workplace. Some jobs are going to become redundant. So when those jobs become redundant, it is your prerogative as the business person to make that call, to say, we're going to keep this job, we're going to let go of this job. So this has nothing to do with the person who is holding the post. It is a structural uh, decision. So we want to make sure we are doing it right. And then at paragraph D, there is the determination or allocation of wages, salaries, pensions, accommodation, leave, or other such benefits. So this is now what accrues to the employee. We're going to look at this next uh, week, I think. Let's look at it um, in, the, in the next session. These are the contractual issues that you're going to find in there. You cannot discriminate on that. And then the choice of persons for jobs or posts. Now, this is where you're talking about appointments. There are some jobs that you do not apply for, that you are invited to. <laughs> the, the, you are, you are headhunted. So when you go headhunting, it is a recruitment process. There's nothing wrong with headhunting, where you go out and say, we want to go and, um, and, and uh, they, they call it head, head poaching, but that's not the right term. So headhunting, you're actually going out there with someone in mind to attract them to your organization because of the special skill set. So you cannot always advertise for such people. So when you're looking, for example, maybe for your CEOs, some companies will not advertise. Some, especially your high-level companies, they'll not. Because when they advertise, they, they open themselves to, to the, 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 the public scrutiny on their processes. So the more sophisticated the companies are, they will actually invite you. They, they will have checked you out. So when you come in for an interview, it is not even a structured one. You, you're coming in and you're having dinner. Little do you know, that is your interview. <laughs> that is your interview. And um, for, for, for these kind of uh, jobs where you are appointed, um, I, I'm not sure if uh, there are adverts for ministers. Uh, I've never seen a scenario whereby the, the, the government would place an advert. Now we need an advert. Uh, we need a minister of education. I think that the president appoints. So for the president to appoint, he, he will then have had to look at um, the capabilities of the people that are within, um, he, 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 he's, um, within his party, right? So I, at least it makes sense. So you cannot then go on and um, do that on um, discriminatory grounds, all right? And the other thing is uh, training. 
in the workspace, when we are picking people who are going to go for training or advancement further education or apprenticeships or even transfer of employees, promotions, retrenchment too. You will notice that all these are employer-initiated actions. It's the employer who decides what happens. And then, of course, there is the, the, the bus at the end. Any other matter related to employment will be covered there. And then the last um, bit before we leave uh, that section, there is um, subsection 2A, which says, No employer shall pay unequal. No employer shall uh, fail to pay equal remuneration to male and female employees for work of equal value. So whenever we're in the workspace, there ought to be equal pay. And what is this equal pay for the same type of work? And um, we'll, we'll be looking at the cases in our next session. For now, I just want to, 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 to dwell much more on the statute. But there's a case that happened in 2018. You will not believe this. This was in BBC. And uh, there was uh, Carrie Grace. Carrie Grace was um, uh, one of uh, the editors. I think she was uh, the editor for China. And uh, she then discovered that um, BBC was uh, paying ladies less than the men in the whole industry, in that whole enterprise. Uh, the, 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 the men were being paid 9.3% on average more than ladies. And so she brought this up. And uh, this was same work as journalists. And um, I, I, you would have expected this to, to, to be happening in third world countries. But this is happening in a first world country. So the issue of gender disparity is still a topical issue. And uh, thereafter, G, I mean, BBC sought to, to revise the structure and, um, and offered the, the, the ladies uh, pay increase and all that. But bottom line, as far as the Zimbabwean law is concerned, uh, sorry for digressing there. Uh, I, th I thought the BBC case would be of interest. As far as the Zimbabwean law is concerned, no one should fail to pay equal pay for an equal job. And should you do so, should you do so, there the, the are points of exemption where you may be exempted from this. And what are these points of exemption? Notice that you are going to be exempt if no person shall be deemed to have discriminated against another person on the grounds of gender or pregnancy, where one, this is now a subparagraph um, one, it says, uh, in accordance with this act or any other law, he provides special conditions for female employees. So in a, on grounds of pregnancy. So if you have, especially the act, the Zimbabwean act, it provides for maternity leave, we already mentioned that, of 98 days, but it doesn't provide for paternity leave. So no matter how much of um, a caring father you are, you cannot come around and claim discrimination. The law has uh, sought to affirm, this is an affirmative action, to affirm the rights of women. So women are going to be given that paid maternity leave of three months. Surely most men, even if they went for maternity leave for for three months, chances are that they're, they're, they're not even going to be doing anything to take care of their women. They better be at work and keep them occupied. <laughs> Jokes aside. All right, so a, a, as far as this particular provision is concerned, the law seeks to affirm the position of women. And the other thing would be on grounds of political opinion or creed. So I, imagine a situation whereby someone says you are not going to be found to have discriminated on grounds of political opinion or creed. Don't stop reading. They go on. It goes on to say, provided. What are the conditions? Where it is shown that the act or omission concerned was done or omitted to be done, as the case may be, by or on behalf of a political, cultural, or religious organization in the bona fide pursuit of the lawful objects of such organization. So if it is already a political party, we do not expect the, the, the commissar uh, of ZANU-PF to apply for a post to become the commissar of ZAPU. We do not expect the administrator at MDC to apply to become the administrator, the chief administrator for ZANU-PF. And when they are not taken up, then they cry discrimination on grounds of political opinion 
the nature of the political entity is that it must advance a political opinion. So you do not subscribe to that kind of an opinion. Therefore, you cannot say you have been discriminated against when they do not choose you. Now, let's go to a religious entity. You, 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 you cannot become um, a, 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 a pastor in the Adventist church. Solis University is an Adventist-owned and run uh, institution. You cannot become a pastor in, the, in an Adventist church if you're Roman Catholic. And neither can you serve as a priest in the Roman Catholic church when you are an Adventist pastor. It, 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 common sense just, 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 just follows there. So, so it, 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 it just doesn't work. And, and the reason is, there is the philosophical uh, pursuit that is already um, ingrained into the existence of this enterprise. So you cannot then go on and say, I'm going to go and advance um, the, the, the doctrinal teaching of the Roman Catholic Church when you do not uh, subscribe to Sunday keeping. You cannot say, I'm going to still go and go on and preach even though I do not subscribe to Sabbath keeping. So these are the issues where the law says, if it has to do with the advancement of uh, bona fide lawful objects of that organization, there is an exception there. Uh, there is a case that uh, you're going to find in uh, Minyarazi's K, a uh, book that he cites there, an interesting one, where a boarding master of a religious organization uh, went into a polygamous relationship. And uh, the, the organization dismissed him uh, for violating its um, tenets. And the law found that his job as a boarding master had nothing to do with uh, um, sharing his beliefs. He was not a pastor, so all he had to do was take care of children and that person had to be reinstated. Um, do I agree with that? No, nah. no, nah, I don't. Is that what the law is in terms of uh, has been decided by the courts? Yes. So what this simply means is that it is only persons who are going to be charged with articulating the philosophy who should then ascribe to it and live by it for other persons whose jobs have nothing to do with the philosophy, have nothing to do with uh, fulfilling those objects, they are not going to be mandated to comply. So this is what the law is. So as you go into the workspace, you want to keep this at the back of your mind, even though you are an employer. But what it becomes is uh, it makes the operations a little too secular. Let me use uh, that. So, so, so it simply means you're going to have only a few people who are aligned to the philosophy of the entity. Does this make uh, operational sense? I'll leave that one to you to decide. And uh, let me not uh, share too many of my opinions. Let's move on to C. It says, on the grounds of, grounds of race or gender, if uh, the act or omission complained of arises from the implementation by the employer of any employment policy or practice aimed at advancement of persons who have been historically disadvantaged by discriminatory laws, or practices. So you could have a situation where we're seeking to reverse, to reverse, sorry, reverse an imbalance, a previous imbalance, a historical one. This is not going to be discrimination. Where you're going to say people of this particular, uh, I, I, I looked at, um, did you know that we, we have the Khoisan in Zimbabwe, uh, somewhere in Cholocho there? These are people who have been previously disadvantaged. So if the government goes out and says, um, I know of late they were getting documentation. These people were not documented. They didn't even have um, birth certificates and things like that, but they are in Zimbabwe. So most of us have birth certificates and we don't think it's an issue. But some people do not have these. So if you do not have a birth certificate, obviously you did not even take grade seven. So if the government were to come up with a policy that says everyone who's Khoisan, we want to make sure that they get an opportunity to learn and we want to plow back into that community and uh, they go on to give them free primary education, free secondary education, free um, uh, university education, tertiary education, and thereafter reserve employment sports to say you're going to employ so many people from the Khoisan uh, um, communities. That is going to be an affirmative action. It is not discriminatory. You're trying to reverse so that you, you balance. That's the social uh, advancement in the workplace. And... Um, the, other, the, the, the last part that we can look at is there can be a distinction, uh, exclusion, or preference and respect of a particular job 
which is based on the narrowly defined uh, inherent operational requirements. Um, and these partic particular requirements would be the needs and necessities of that particular job. So you would have um, your academic requirements. Uh, some of these requirements, for example, uh, I think an MP must at least have all levels. Why? Why, why, why should they have all levels? Um, I don't know. I mean, um, a minister must have at least all levels. The, the reason why they must have some basic education, in spite of uh, being appointed to a post, it, it, it is so that they should be in a position to articulate and even operate within that particular sphere. So you cannot say it is discrimination for you to say those who are uneducated should not come in here. When they go in there, they might not understand the processes because of the nature of the job. And you could have, um, there's this other one, an interesting one that I found, uh, as far as air hostesses are concerned. The air hostesses are supposed to, to reach for the cabin. Uh, you know, when you get into a plane, um, there, there, there's a cabin that is right at the, uh, at the top. So the air hostess is supposed to be able to reach that. So if you had a scenario whereby um, someone is, um, um, I hope it's the right term, uh, they, they're called midgets, midgets. Uh, the, the small, the small built people, right? Those who are small built, right? They, they, they will not ordinarily, ordinarily reach the, the, the cabin if you are a certain height. So if you are generally small, you would not reach that, uh, that, that cabin. So because of the operational needs of that space, you need to ensure that you're getting people who are of a certain height. So if you do not meet that requirement, you, you, you may be asked to step aside. So these are the operational requirements of the job. And the other thing that you could be looking at is, um, what do you call it? You could be looking at um, decency. Yes, decency. The decency requirements would be, uh, for example, a situation whereby you are in a school setup and you need um, a dean of residence, a dean of women, dean of men. So when you are doing this, it already follows that your dean of men will be a man because you may have to walk into bathrooms when, 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 when men are bathing in there and you, you may walk into, in, into um, bathrooms when ladies are bathing. So, so imagine a scenario whereby our, our, our dean for the ladies' hostels is a man. You, you, you are inspecting the rooms and, you know, people want to be free in their allocated rooms. So the, these are the issues where you'd say, for, for, for that decency and convenience, you'd really need to, to have people like that. And then of course, lastly, the, the, the act also states clearly that there are some uh, defenses that are not going to be available to you in spite of these exemptions, and you'll find these in uh, um, subsection eight. It says, it shall be no defense to a charge in respect of contravention of section one or two to prove that A, the employee concerned was not in fact taken into employment. So if the person was not employed, you're not going to argue and say, the person was not in, employed anyway, so there's no issue. Nah, sorry, that's not a defense that is available to you. And number two, the employee concerned has left. So someone can leave your enterprise and still sue for discrimination. And number C, the employee concerned has subs subsequently been taken into employment. So even if the person was discriminated against, subsequently offered the job, it does not mean they cannot sue for discrimination that happened prior to that. And the employer who was discriminating eventually withdrew or did not fill the vacancy. The fact that you applied, I mean, you set up an advert that is discriminatory, it does not excuse you from being liable. It could likely have caused discrimination had you filled the vacancy. This is where now it comes into act. And then the other item that you want to look at is the employee concerned um, charged is no longer committing any contravention. So even if you stop doing this, it does not mean the discrimination that you were perpetrating three, four months ago uh, ceases to be an issue. It is still going to be an issue. So you are not going to be excused because of that. So this is as far as um, discrimination is concerned. And the last one, you cannot come up with a defense 
that it was for business interests, for profits. You cannot say it made more sense for me to do it this way. That doesn't work either. So there is a need now for us to look at the entire recruitment process and say the advancement of social justice basically means the government puts in its big foot in there and says this is how we're going to do it so that there is social justice and it is achieved. Now we've looked at the first R. In our next section, we're going to be looking at the next R, that is recruitment, and I'll encourage you to look up section number 12 on contracts and remuneration. That's the section that we're going to look at in our next session. Until we meet again, God bless.